and uh, already got my word studies for next year, so I'm excited about that, um, get, getting into those. But as I finish these in my Bible readings uh, this week, and I come across these last, one of these two that's in Colossians chapter 1 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I thought about this, that's what we're facing today, and so I wanted to share them with you real quick. And then I'll get to the sermon, which is uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapters 2 through 4, uh, a message there for us today. I, I feel that as we're getting again, getting ready for the close of the year, it's needful for us to uh, examine ourselves and get ready on that. So back in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, the word deliver, and he gives us this, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us under the kingdom of his dear son. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, is that deliver again, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Both of those word studies there, deliver, you look at that first one, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, brought us out of lostness, sin. Again, when you're sitting around for Thanksgiving, and unless you look at people in their lostness, you never really appreciate your salvation to some extent. Uh, I think what you normally moves me is a catalyst to pray for others. Here's what my prayer is. They're in darkness. They can't see. I mean, we've got the artificial lights on in here. The sun's shining through the window. You can see. But again, in darkness, you can't see. And God, who is light, shines in this darkness and delivers us out of that darkness and, and from the power of darkness. In other words, Satan's hold. You try to communicate to people. You try to reason with people. You try to coerce people. Hey, come to church with me. Hey, get your life right. Hey, get saved. And, and they can't. They're not delivered from that. So the first one there is a prayer for you, especially as you was praying there in our opening. So many of you prayed that for the lost, those that are hell bound. Right there is what you pray. Deliver them from that, the darkness and from the power of darkness. And then in verse 10, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now that combination there is also with John 3.36. He that believeth on Jesus has everlasting life. He that believeth not on Jesus, the wrath of God abides upon him. So again, the twofold comparison here, one or the other. Is you or ain't you, in perfect West Virginia English? Uh, are you delivered or not? Delivered from this lostness, brought into salvation. Christ has delivered me from sin. That again, sin has no dominance, it has no... No power over us so long as we rest in Christ in them. So, again, our prayer. Deliver them from the wrath to come uh, in the day and the age that we're facing today with that. So those two word studies that I do deliver uh, in those two passages of Scripture, uh, that spoke to me so much this morning in my prayer time, and I just wanted to pass that along for you for two cents of nothing. Okay? So there you go. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3, and, and chapter 2 and 4, I should say. And three times, uh, this, this again is, when I talk about the word studies, there are, there's individual words and then there's phrases. The phrases are, and it came to pass. Now again, that's in King James, so if you got another translation, you're not going to see that. But hundreds of times in the Bible when it says, and it came to pass. Uh, and so that's a phrase that I've marked in the Bible. All the questions of the Bible is a phrase that I've marked. Heaven and earth, the combination of that. Score, again, scores of times, hundreds of times that that's, that's used in the Scripture. And here's another one that I've just picked up. And probably the last two times I've been coming through, I've been marking it. Uh, I write, write these out uh, in the side of my handy-dandy Thompson Chain Reference Bible. Uh, where I've got room, and I put it all in capital letters, and it is the phrase, please God. So every time in the scriptures, which again is about a hundred times, they did, they please God, or they did not please God. Now we've seen that in our study in Genesis. 
uh, in, in the flood. The people that were on the face of the earth, when God looked at them, was he pleased with them? No, he wasn't pleased with them. But now when he looked at Noah, who was righteous in his sight, and again, righteousness means to be right with God as God is right, and we're supposed to be righteous. To be righteous means is that you please God in this. So three times here now, in 1 Thessalonians 2, in chapter 2, and then 1 in chapter 4, um, that this phrase of pleasing God is used. And I want to bring that to you today because, again, of the combination of us, what we're facing, the end of the year, which, again, is constantly on my mind, uh, where you're at, your struggles, your losing ground, gaining ground, or as you would say, well, I'm holding my own. You know, that's like when you ask someone, how you doing? And they say, fair to middling. What's fair to middling mean? You ain't gained nothing, you ain't lost nothing. But that's not, that's not encouraging. Uh, again, if I was to say, well, how's your year been for the Lord? And you would say, fair to Midland, saying, well, I haven't really gained anything, but I also haven't lost anything. Well, we're supposed to be growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, aren't we? So don't be content, don't be satisfied uh, with fair to Midland. But again, our supreme goal right now where we're at in our walk with God is this. And this is the question that you and I have to answer. It's what I ask myself all the time. Lord, did I please you today? Are you pleased with me? Now again, to be able to lay our heads down tonight, Sunday, Sunday night, and to lay down on the pillows and for the Lord to say, in you, I am well pleased. I think you would rest well, wouldn't you? I don't think you would rest well if God would say, I'm not very happy with you right now. You're not where you're supposed to be. You know better, but you're not doing better. You're missing the mark. You've lost ground now here in November. Then you, you were stronger for me and closer to me back in January. And now 11 months later, Satan's got a hold of you. Your flesh is commanding you. And you're further away from me now than you've ever been. I'm not pleased. Now again, these are the questions. This is the statement that he's making. Please God. So in chapter 2, we start in verse 4, and then down in verse 15. Uh, chapter 2, verse 4, verse 15. And I'll read the verses in front of them to get us where the, the, the background here on where we're at. So in verse 3, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in God. So again, Paul's talking to this church in Thessalonica, and he's saying our exhortation, in other words, our preaching to you. I did lie to you, and it wasn't for a gain, and it wasn't unclean or any hidden motive. It was just to do this, verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put into trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. Verse 15, who both killed the Lord Jesus, and again he's talking about the Jews here, verse 14 and 15, he starts mentioning the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and has persecuted us, and they do not please God, and they are contrary to all men. And then down in chapter 4, verse 1, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and we exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that, ye, at, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you again upon reading your word here in just a couple verses couple chapters. Uh, Lord, there is stress, this little phrase, to please you. And Lord, again, I know that in the certainty of this, that there has never been nor ever will be a child of God who is so close to you, knows what you have done for them that would do anything to displease you. And so 
So, Lord, for these that are saved here today, our, our number one priority, quest, our goal, our, our achievement, our standard, the Lord, is to please you. That when we uh, fall short of that, Lord, is that we read in this one verse, they did not please you. Uh, Lord, again, we know that we've hurt the cause. We've hurt the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, again, we would pray one for another. We would guard against this. And that you would teach us today again, Lord, what it is to please you. And to pray for all of your church, Lord. That they would rise up, having been exhorted as we hear, having heard the word. That they would set that standard and goal to please you. For, Lord, you're worthy. You're worthy to be pleased. You're worthy to be praised. And, Lord, again, all things proceed from you. Easily given and easily taken away. And so, Lord, again, we set this standard in front of us today. May your Holy Spirit do its best work in us and through us, Lord, for your honor and glory in Christ's name. Amen. All right, I want to, again, teaching mode here more than preaching. Let's just walk through this. Let's just take all three of these verses one by one and extract from them what you need. Uh, I'll get the, the juice and the needle and inject it into your spiritual soul. Okay, and you can feed on this, I pray, and share it with others in this as, we, as what we're saying. Uh, so back in chapter 2, verse 4, we'll start with the first one here. And again, the goal is that your standard, my standard as a Christian, as the church, is to do what? <coughs> Please God. It's an easy one. Please God, right? So there's our standard in this. And again, you have to follow that with the question, Lord... Am I pleasing to you? You think God's going to lie to you? Nope. You know, the idea of this is, is like, again, we, we get soft on this because of people's feelings. You know, if Rebecca does something, she goes into the kitchen and she's cooking something, baking something, and she brings it out and say she's going to make uh, pancakes, and she forgets to put something in them. And they're flat and they don't not much taste and they don't look right and they don't taste good and she says what do you think now as to me not to hurt her feelings I'm gonna say what oh God just make me make, make me some more right but in honesty what's the answer try again you failed so you think God really in the sense of this of pleasing him is he's gentle with us he's kind to us but remember his purpose are we pleasing him in this and where again you begin to lose ground i i'm thinking about that um, so often people that begin but they don't finish i can't tell you and in, in and again people that are in my my salvation list pray for them Oh, I, and I did this this morning in my, in my transferring my notes out of my old Bible to this Bible. In Matthew, he gave the parable of the sower and the seed, which I've given to you and preached to you so many times. And I come to that second, the, the second seed. Now, the first seed he threw on the wayside, and he says, and this is the word of God. And as soon as someone hears it, Satan comes and takes it from them. I mean, it doesn't have a chance. They hear it, but they don't have a chance to do anything with it, and they reject it. It's just removed. So that's when people are just obstinate against the gospel. Or you give them a tract, and they don't even open and read it. You know, Dad used to put a dollar in and say, can I, buy, can I buy a minute of your time with a dollar? In other words, take time to read the tract in this. But the second thing is that when they hear the gospel, they, they re rejoice. They joy. Oh, this is the best thing. This is what I need. And, and you're so excited for them. Man, they're going, they're going to get saved. They're going to come follow the Lord. They're going to please God. But it says is that the moment that tri tribulations and persecutions come is that they reject it and they run away from it. So again, so many that I've seen in that, in that caliber of this. And so he says here in this, we were allowed of God. By God's permission, God's gift to us, we were put in trust with the gospel sake. Almost every one of you got the Bible laying there in your lap. You've been entrusted with the word of God. 
So often we mention this in our in our prayer time. We know the nations that don't have Bibles. They don't have opportunity to sit and preach and teach like this. Uh, I, I would love to go to China. As a matter of fact, I uh, often long and linger for this is that when they talk about the underground church, because again, I think I think I need to go to China and see what the underground church is doing and how they're doing it because I fear that our days are coming. So I want to be ready. But you know how many people they got when they assemble for church? They gather in a house like this. Iran, the underground church in Iran, where again, to be found out that, you, that you've got a Bible or mentioning Christ or proselyting Christ is that it's a jail sentence or a death sentence right off the bat. It isn't smack on the wrist like our court systems is. I mean, it is detrimental to family. Put them in the jail and throw away the key in this. Standing room. I was thinking about that today. I think Jacob prayed that. Did you pray for the, all the rooms to be filled? I think so. Philip prayed that. I would love to have to stand back up against the wall here in the living room and the stairwell. People sitting in the stairwell and the kitchen and, and clear out in the mud room, standing shoulder to shoulder. Here's a tent of saying, we want to hear the gospel. Because God entrusted that to us, that we speak it, that we know it, that we understand it. And when the congregation is called together, they assemble. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. God put us in trust with this gospel, even so that as we speak, not to please men, but to please who? God, which tries our hearts. Your, your goal, my goal, is to speak the word of God to people, not to please them, but to please God. And again, to communicate to them the gospel truth that he has given and trusted to us with this. Now again, our day and age is that we have a false gospel. Just, just say this prayer, get baptized, and you're saved. And again, can God save someone like that? Absolutely. You know, but I also know is that for most people that when they get to that part or they get to that place is that they've said a prayer, they've been baptized, but they've never really surrendered their heart to their life to Christ. They've walked away from it. And they began, but they didn't get back to it. So in this place here where we're at here where he's talking about pleasing God with the gospel that you and I are supposed to be giving that gospel to other people. We're to be talking to other people about that. So in this midst, is that thing back there? Mm -hmm. I can, yeah, I'm just uh, trying to get Philip's attention. There's not much you can do about it. So okay. the wind, when the wind blows there, sometimes the back grabs on me, so sorry about that. But again, let's just focus on pleasing God, right? Not, not to that, okay? So that first one there is ever so important. So as we speak to please men, because God's trying the heart, where, where are you at? Once you've heard the gospel, where are you at with this truth, with this gospel message in this? Now, in chapter 2, verse 16, or verse 15, he goes to the negative side of this, where he opens this up about the Jews, and he says directly about the Jews. Now, he was a Jew. Remember, Paul came from Judaism. He was a Hebrew. He, he had persecuted the church. You, know, you should know the testimony. Um, Acts chapter 9, how Paul was on the road to Damascus or Saul <coughs> at that time. And what happened to him? What's his, what's his testimony? A bright light shone from heaven, blinded him, knocked him off of his, his animal, and, and Jesus came and spoke to him. You had red, red letters there in Acts chapter 9. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou men? And, and he said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute." And he said, now go into Damascus and wait, and I will send one of my servants, Ananias, and he will pray over you, he will communicate the gospel to you, and you shall be saved. And of course, you know that account that Ananias was scared to death to go see him. He said, Lord, I've heard about this guy. He kills Christians. I don't want to go see him. Can't you send someone else? You know, let, let's all, all in favor of Carl going to see him. Say aye. So... Uh, volunteers being accepted in this. And so Ananias goes in, and it's one of the best verses there, and he found Paul doing what? Anybody know this? And he, pray, and he was praying. 
on the, and again on the street called anybody know this on the street called straight and, and Karen prayed that keep us on the straight and the narrow path or the straight and the narrow way there and this is where that's at but these Jews they do not please God anybody that speaks contrary to the gospel of Christ do not please him Anybody that lives a life that is in contra contrast to the gospel of light, they live in darkness, and they love darkness, and they play with darkness, and they straddle the fence. You know, Sunday they're in church, but on Monday they're back in their sin. They're, they're doing things that are anti-God. And you see people that preach this and teach this that they are not true preachers. They're not true teachers because they speak more of themselves or of other men in their commentaries than they do the word of God. That's the reason I've gotten to this place in my ministry. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, how long have you been preaching? And I said, oh, 30 years. And I said, and I've come to this conclusion, I don't need to preach Dan Bison. I just need to preach the book. Let's just study the book. Let's just read the book. Can God lie? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but through that, you know, th this entire this entire week has been ups and downs. Um, Carl Carl would know these is over at Fox's Hollow. Uh, and, you know, one of the couples that were coming there, they had a tragic accident. The uh, wife backed the uh, back in the truck back into the barn, uh, and the accelerator stuck or something, and she plowed right into him and snapped his uh, spine. Uh, and collapsed the barn uh, with the with the truck and that. And again, you so you go down, you you don't know what you're going to walk into. The emergency care, uh, critical condition, and that. And you walk in, and again, services like this, where we've sung songs, we've laughed, we joked, we've prayed, we've read read and studied. You know why this is all is? And I think about this so much. This is what gets us ready for moments like this. When you walk into the emergency room, when you go into the intensive care unit, and he's conscious, he's speaking, spine snapped, but he's able to move his limbs because you and I both know, one, he could have been killed, mm -hmm. two, he could have been paralyzed, three, <coughs> brain damaged, not able to communicate, and so you see this, and again, the song, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Dave, you're talking to me. Dave, you're able to move your limbs. You're going to walk out of this hospital. You're going to get to go back home because, again, not everybody gets to. To go from that to another child of God, Jean, she's in her last days, her last weeks. She's comatose. She's fading. It's not, it's not a question of if. It's a question of when. She's going to go out and again to walk in and to answer this question. To be able to say to a saint, to be able to say to a child of God, well, all that we've ever talked about and all that we've ever discussed about the gospel, it now comes to this point because within a matter of hours or days or weeks, you're going to fulfill what God brought you into this world for. You're going to get ready and go into an eternity. To be able to answer this, you please God. But you and I both know those that do not please God. They're playing with fire, aren't they? One breath away from an eternity. Death and dying. The valley of the shadow of death walking through it. And God not pleased with them. What's he going to say? What's it going to be? The urgency of that. That I'm pleasing. I'm, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. Because there are numerous of these that are out there teaching and exhorting them that aren't pleasing to God. They don't live a life of, of Christianity. They don't live a life of holiness. They are mockery. The world scoffs at it. They do not please God. They're only pleasing themselves. You see the standards. You see the practices of this. And again, life. This is what it's all about. Tragedy. You and I are more worried about how much pumpkin pie and how much calories we're going to put on for Thursday. And that's all, that's all good. You know, that's part of life as well. Holidays, memories, experiences, that's all wonderful. But 
you and I both know. And again, how often do I say it on Sunday? And I thought about that as I come out of the hospital there the other night. I thought I always say that to both churches on Sunday. We don't know what this week's going to hold for us. But the Lord does. And that is how often that has happened in the midst of this. So it brings me to the last one now. We've got those that God has entrusted us with the gospel to please him by telling people that truth. But we also know that there are those who do not please him that are causing greater damage and harm as well. So we come to the last one in chapter 4, verse 1 there. We exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and how you ought to please God. Now here again, to go down through the checklist, how do you please God? This is the question that we have to, that we have to answer. Again, I present to you the four pillars of where we're at. Prayer, Bible reading, church, and gospel, and evangelism, sharing the gospel. And again, the opportunities that you come down to this. This is what pleases God because, again, in numerous other passages of Scripture, He declares this. This is my kingdom. This is my will. This is what I want done. Study to show yourself approved unto God. You know, how important is the Word of God? In the beginning was the... John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the word came into this world, but men love <coughs> darkness rather than light. So again, you go to this, who the names of Christ. He is the word. How important is the book? Very important. And it pleases God to know. So that when you go in to talk to people, like, like these experiences that I shared about death and dying, and you go in, uh, what are you going to say? Hey, how are you doing? Well, you're laying in critical care. How are you doing? Now, again, he said that to me. He said, well, how are you doing? I said, better than you. <laughs> you know, the honesty, the truth of it. You're laying there with tubes and pipes coming out of you. You're all busted up. It ain't good. But again, you could be decaying physically. But you could say, but I've never been better spiritually. Mm -hmm. I'm pleasing God. And again, my time comes to you or your time comes to me. Uh, for example, say that the you know, the close of this year into the first of the new year, cancer has ravaged uh, near and far as we've talked about and said, and, and I'm the next one. I'm the next one. I, I've got a, a cancer, a tumor in me, and the doctor says you've got six months to live. And I'm going to be laid flat on the bed. And I'm going to be laying on the couch or in the recliner. And you get to come in and see me. Joy, joy. And you say, how you doing, Dan? You and I can sit and talk about what? Pleasing God. Can I remember this? Can I go back and tell you the times that pleased God the most? Times that over there in Burlington, an 18-year-old kid, I'd walk up on the top of the mountain, a mile straight up on top of the ridge there, and I'd preach the bark right off the pine tree. I pleased God. Times that I, just like the other night there, she had a game down there at Petersburg and went down there and I saw, oh, 30 years ago, my first pastor down there, 19-year-old snot-nosed kid, and stopped and visited one of the ladies that took me in. Her and her husband took me in and I, I slept in their basement uh, and she cooked for me and tended to me just like I was her own son. He passed away about a year and a half ago. Uh, and so we stopped and visited with her and, and we reminisced about things that pleased God. Went over to the ball game and all these family uh, members come in for this one girl that played against her. Uh, and I'd been in their house and sat at their tables and ran with their kids. And we reminisced again. Not just memories of experiences, but how we please God. Prayers off. Spiritual conversation. Eternal. Eternal things. Please God. And so again, we set you, we have exhorted you, we've revealed to you that this gospel that we have walked in is the same that you ought to walk in. This is what you're supposed to be doing. That's the reason I said is that go forward and find someone this this month, this week, family sitting at the table with you this week. Say, hey, I've got to ask you this question. I got to know, are you pleasing God? Are you where you're supposed to be? 
Because again, you and I both know, even though we don't want to talk about it, that time's coming. It's not going to be a happy, joyous time, laughing and food fights and whatever else you do at Thanksgiving, and kicking each other underneath the table or, or stealing each other's whipped cream of the pumpkin pie, I don't, whatever. That time is good, those times are funny, those times are great and glorious and memorial and all that, but there's a time coming too that we're going to be at that time where we're saying goodbye. And that's the bottom line question of it all. Are we pleasing? Did we please God? To get up in the morning, your number one goal every morning when you get up is to say, Lord, I want to please you today. To come at the beginning of the month, the close of the month, as I'm trying to get you to do here at the end of November and the first of December, Lord, I want to please you. Man, I'm telling you, when I hit December the 1st, I know i got 31 days to finish this year out, and I want to strive in all that I'm doing to please you. Lord, again, I want to start the new year right. I want to please you. I know all the times that I've not pleased him. My, all my faults, all my failures, all my sins, all my iniquities, all my disobedience, and I, dis, I, I didn't please him. And it grieves me. No Christian is ever can ever be satisfied when they're not pleasing him. And Paul says this. He says, me and my compadres here that have come in to you, and you know them, Timothy and Titus and uh, Silas and all these that came, Apollos, that came in and preached and taught just like Paul did to exhort the brothers and the sisters in the church, is to say, I encourage you, walk as we walk, be as we are. And again, not so that there was little Paul Jr. running around, but images of Christ. It's not my desire that people would follow me to be Dan Bizer uh, imitators. I don't need that. But to be Christ-like in all that we undertake and all that we do. You know, I had quoted that, I've seen that R.A. Torrey, uh, who followed right after D.L. Moody back in the 1900s, and he was worldwide evangelism, crusades, things like that. Great, great saint, great man of God. Great man of prayer in that. And he wrote that little, they, somebody had copied that on Twitter there, and I recopied it, uh, and he said, the most blessed way to read your Bible is on your knees. Uh, two or three of the saints that I had read, Charles Finney, uh, Torrey, and I forget who the other one was, might have been George Mueller, I read that in their biography. They read the Bible on their knees. Now again, here are saints that lived over 100 years ago, long before me, but, you know, but I read what they did and I said, I like that. I'm going to try that. I used, to, I used to be lazy when I would read my Bible, and that's not to scoff at you if you do it this way, but I used to lay on my bed. I'd lay right there on the side of my head up and I'd read. I'm at ease, I'm at comfort, reading my Bible on my bed. I was never convicted about it, never nothing like that. But then when I read those guys, that they, they read the Bible on their knees, I said, i got to try that. And I've done it ever since. So I, I told a guy that the other week when we was talking about reading our Bibles through, I said twice a year, I said I read the Bible on 30, 35 minutes every morning, or most mornings, reading the Bible on my knees. I want to be respectful of it. I want to be centered in on this. It keeps me centered in on this. I found that when I was laying on my bed is that it was too easy for me to say, well, I'll just take a cat nap while I'm here. Or be distracted with something else, you know, that pulled me away from that. So again, not that everybody's got to read the Bible on their knees, but that's something that I picked up from those saints and I incorporated in my spiritual disciplines. And I find I please God with that. You have to find what pleases God with what you're doing. But I can tell you this much. Not to do it at all does not please him at all. Someone says, well, I don't have to read the Bible on my knees. I don't have to pray on my knees. You're absolutely right. But you do have to read and pray. Well, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable witnessing to people. <coughs> None of us are. It's not an easy thing for most, if not all. But it's the right thing to please with him. But your question is not if. Your question is, am I pleasing you? Examination of yourself, my, my own self in this, my heart, my intent, my priorities, 
my purposes? Why do I do what I'm doing? To hear that voice at the end of the day, well, I'm pleased with you what you, did, what you got done today. To be like those at the valley of the shadow of death and getting ready to meet them face to face and to say, in you I am well pleased. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So here it is. Three, three instances of this. And the message is the truth for all of us. But you and I have to answer. Lord, are you pleased with me? Are you pleased with us? And to move forward in that. Corrections need to be made. Changes. Confess and repent. Restart. This is a new day. Get back to it. Don't lose any momentum. Don't lose any day. Because again, like I sowed that with the sower in the scene, someone says, I'm telling you, I'm resolved. I'm going to get back to my Bible. I'm going to get back to prayer. I'm going to get back to closer to God. I'm telling you that anybody that resolves that, guess who's going to meet you before you hit the door? Our enemy. The one who does not please God. To get you to live a life that does not please Him. Be resolved. Be what you're supposed to be. Please God. Let's pray.